Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is Haley Thomas with PetraSkills John M. Campbell. And today, Mr. Mick Crabtree will be presenting a practical guide to instrument signal loops. Mick has spent the last eight years running industrial workshops throughout the world in the fields of process control and instrumentation, data communications, field bus, emergency shutdown systems, project management, online analysis, and technical writing and communications. He has trained over 5,000 engineers, technicians, and scientists. Mr. Crabtree formally trained in aircraft instrumentation and guided missiles in the Royal Air Force, having completed his service career seconded to the Ministry of Defense, and he was responsible for ensuring the reliability, maintainability, and functional usefulness of specific equipment entering the Royal Air Force. He is the former editor and managing editor of Pulse Magazine, South Africa's leading monthly journal dedicated to the general electronic and process control instrumentation industries. He has written and published six technical handbooks on industrial process control. Mr. Crabtree holds a Master in Science Research in Industrial Flow Measurement and an HNC in Electrical Engineering with distinctions. Mick, we're so happy to have you here today. Thank you for presenting this webinar for us. Thank you. Um, thank you, Haley. Thanks very much. Okay, um, let's have a look at our learning goals. Um, so by the end of this uh, module, you'll be able to um, explain basically how a thermocouple works. You'll be able to relate the problems associated with um, amplifying a very small voltage for transmission over a very long distance. Um, we'll be dis able to describe the basic principles of the 4 to 20 milliamp uh, uh, instrumentation signal loop. Um, we need to do a little bit of background, recall some of the basics of intrinsic safety um, in use in hazardous areas. Um, and most importantly, we'll be able to select a transmitter based on the uh, load limitations. We'll be able to look at uh, how a loop splitter repeater works. And we can show how we can provide actually using the 4 to 20 milliamp loop, we can still provide a diagnostics fault output. So we need to start off with, right at the beginning, what on earth is a thermocouple? Um, and the, it really started in 1821 when Seebeck made use of two um, different wires, and uh, two types of wire. He actually used uh, copper and antimony. Um, and he literally twisted them together. He put one end in a reference, an ice bar, and he put the other in um, a variable temperature. He, wore, he varied the temperature. And he found, he discovered that as he varied the temperature, um, he got a voltage output that varied according to the actual temperature. So when the junctions were held at different temperatures, um, it was a function of the temperature difference and the composition of the two metals. He also did um, uh, experimentation um, to show that different metals, different combinations produce different voltages. But most important, he found that for a given temperature um, and a given set of um, materials, he got a constant output, a, a millivolt output. And this was most important. Of interest, um, later a man by the name of Peltier discovered the reverse effect, that you could actually, by varying the voltage applied to the uh, junctions, if you like, he could actually create a heat pump. And there are a technology based on, uh, on this used for uh, refrigeration. Um, obviously, it was a little cumbersome to make use of, um, <laughs> of an ice bar. So made use of what is called a cold junction reference. And basically that was um, the ice bath was replaced by a, a block of material of a sufficient mass to withstand fluctuations in the, the ambient temperature. Um, and the, by measuring, um, um, ideally that would be held at zero degrees C, simulating the ice bath. Well, we can't do that. Um, it's not practical. So, in fact, what happens is that the temperature of that block is actually measured and we apply compensation. 
The um, whole range of different uh, thermocouples are available. Uh, some 300 different types have actually been studied, described, that we r really recognize only eight um, designations, only generally eight, and we can see that uh, they are shown here. Um, uh, we've got, um, and that is the T, J, E, K, N, and the R, S, B. They're all different materials. These, the R, S, and the B, um, as you can see, for very high temperatures, measured high temperatures, are all based on platinum. They're known as noble metal thermocouples. Um, and the, the, the E, the J, the T, the K are based on different materials. Now, there is, hopefully you can see, there is um, a general problem with the use of thermocouples. And the problem is very simple, that the outputs are very small. We're talking about millivolts. We're not producing nice big signals. We're producing millivolts. Um, in the case of um, R, a type R, it, it's producing at a 1600 degrees. It's still only about 20 thousandths of a volt, 20 millivolts. So it's very small. The other problem is that it's not linear. I need to have some relationship. What is the relationship between the actual voltage output, the millivoltage output, and the temperature? And we can see that. Let's have a look at a, a type T thermocouple. That's this one here. Um, I've brought that up. Um, type T thermocouple is a, a mixture of copper and constantan. One, in other words, one leg of the thermocouple is uh, is copper, and the other is uh, uh, constantan. Constantan is a is an alloy. Um, it was uh, devised in Germany many uh, uh, years ago, and it is a mixture of copper, 57% um, copper and 43% nickel. Uh, type T thermocouple extends quite a wide temperature range, uh, but in the negative sense. So it's not, it hasn't got a very high upper limit. But let's have a look at it a bit closer because somewhere I've got to be able to relate um, the uh, thermocouple with the millivolt temperature. And what we've got here is a table. Now this is in degrees Celsius. Um, there are tables also available in degrees Fahrenheit. And this relates uh, what we can see at zero degrees, this is my reference, the output is zero. But let's just take an example. What temperature, for example, would give an output of four millivolts? So if I look along here, there's my, uh, these are all my millivolts here, and if I move along here, I can see that that's about the closest, that's uh, four millivolts, and at four millivolts, I would have 90, 1, 92, 93, uh, or 94 degrees Celsius. Um, so an output of 4 millivolts from a type T thermocouple would indicate that the temperature, um, when referenced to zero, uh, is 94 degrees Celsius. Um, now, the problem is, because I've got such uh, small uh, voltages, um, we need to amplify it into larger ones so I can transmit it over long distances. And we accomplish this by means of a, a transmitter. And this, in this case, the transmitter is simply amp acting um, as an amplifier. That's all it's doing. It's taking a very small thermocouple um, voltage and it's going to uh, transmit it to give me a larger output that I can transmit, probably uh, one, two, maybe three kilometers. In other words, up to about two miles of uh, along a, a wire, uh, to, because this is out in the field, and I've got to transmit this into the control room. Um, again, let's have a look at a type T thermocouple, um, and we're going to assume a span that is, the range I want to cover is um, 0 to 10 millivolts. What temperature range would that cover? And we can see here from the, ten, uh, the, the table, again for a type T, that uh, 10 millivolts, that would be about there. Um, 
would be 210, um, 213. So as this ranges from 0 to 10 millivolts, I'm going to get a range from 0 to 213 degrees C. But I want to transmit this um, over a long distance. So I've got a wide range, I've got a large uh, signals could we have. And that's, um, over the years, a whole uh, um, pantheon, if you like, of different uh, 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 outputs have been devised. Um, and, uh, for example, I could use um, all I need to do in this case, um, amplify it by a thousand times, and I could range it from zero to ten volts. Um, another one, standard was two to ten volts. Another one was zero to five volts. Another one, one to five volts. We had zero to 20 milliamps. We had four to 20 milliamps. And we had 10 to 50 milliamps. These were all standards at one time. And they, they finally standardized on the four to 20 milliamps uh, only in 1975. Up until then, it was anybody's guess what people were using. Uh, it was a bit of a nightmare, to put it bluntly, but it took many, many years of arguing to finally standardize on the 4 to 20 milliamp uh, uh, loop. Why? Let's assume an output of 0 to 10 volts. Let's assume that this is, as this ranges from 0 to 10 millivolts, the output is going to range from 0 to 10 volts. Um, we've got a load resistance of um, uh, this could be, as I say, up to a kilometer, half a mile or more away from the, uh, that, that transmitter, I've got a load resistance. Um, how much of the actual output voltage is actually going to appear across the load? Well, um, this is not actually realistic at all, what I've shown here. Let's have a look at a, a more realistic situation. Um, because whether I like it or not, this long lead that I'm going to lead out into the, the uh, to, towards the control room is going to have resistance. The, res the actual uh, wire is going to have resistance. I've just taken an example here, five ohms um, in each arm. And then I'm going to say, well, what is the current and uh, how much of the voltage will appear across the resistor? Well, this is pretty simple Ohm's law and the current is going to be uh, according to Ohm's law, the current is going to be equal to the voltage divided across the, divided by the resistance. And so I've got 10 volts divided by the total resistance, which is 100 plus the two um, 5 ohm resistors there. So that's 110, and it gives me a figure of 0 0.0909. In other words, uh, uh, just on 0.1 of just under 0.1 of an amp. But please note, it is not 0.1 of an amp. Um, it's less than that. The net result is what's the voltage going to be developed across the load uh, will be hmm, the voltage is I, the voltage times the, uh, the, sorry, the resistance times the current, and that is going to be 9.091 volts. In other words, instead of developing 10 volts across there, I'm only developing just over 9 volts. So I've already got a 9% error as a result of the lead resistance. And since that is generally unknown and can vary, uh, this is not going to be a really good idea because it means I have no idea what the actual voltage I'm going to be developing across there. I'm sending out 10 volts and I'm only getting um, uh, something less than that. So what's the answer? Well, here's a, a, a solution. Um, if we look at a constant current generator, um, in this example, as the input varies from 0 to 10 millivolts, that's my thermocouple, the output is going to vary from 0 to 20 milliamps. That sounds good. And I'm going to develop it across a 250 ohm resistor. Um, again, um, what is the voltage developed across the resistor? Well, that's easy. The voltage is equal to IR, and I do know that when that's 10 millivolts, that is 20 milliamps. It's a constant current generator. That doesn't mean it's constant. It means that as this varies, 
This will vary in direct proportion, and when that's 10 millivolts, that's 20 milliamps. So, on that basis, um, I am going to develop across there, um, it's 20, IR, um, is going to be um, the 20 divided by 1,000, which is 20 milliamps, times 250 ohms, which gives me 5 volts. So, as the output varies from 0 to 20 milliamps, by how much does the voltage across the load vary by? Well, it's going to be 0 to 5 volts, and it's going to be constant. Now, let's assume there's a line resistance, as we had before. Line resistance, total line resistance of um, uh, uh, 5 ohms in each arm, so the total line resistance of 10 ohms. What's the current? for a 10 millivolt input. Well, it's going to be 20 milliamps. It's still going to be 20 milliamps. What is, so irrespective of the line resistance, the voltage developed across the resistor is going to be five volts. So using a constant current as distinct from a voltage output, using a constant current, I'm going to be constantly delivering the correct voltage at the load. Um, we've seen previously that as the input varies from 10, from 0 to 10 millivolts, the output's going to vary from 0 to 20 milliamps. Great. Consequently, the voltage across the 250 ohm load is also going to vary from 0 to 5 volts. Do you see a problem here? Maybe. What happens if there's a line break? If there is a line break, I've got a bit of a problem because this is now going to be, I do not know whether in fact, um, because I'm now going to get zero across here, I cannot differentiate between line break and the fact that that is zero. I don't know. This is overcome by what we call a zero offset. In other words, when this varies, as this varies from 0 to 20 milliamps, sorry, 0 to 10 millivolts, I'm not going to vary this from 0 to 20 milliamps. I'm going to vary it from 4 to 20 milliamps. Um, again, across my uh, 250 ohm resistor, so the voltage is now going to vary not from 0 to 5 volts, but from 1 to 5 volts. This means that if I get a break in the line, this will fall to 0, and I can flag it as an error. We'll look at that a little closer later on. But it means that I've now got a, um, a constant current signal, 4 to 20 milliamps, or that it's going to vary in the range 4 to 20 milliamps. So, um, as when the input is actual zero, this is reading four milliamps. In the event of a line break, the output current falls to zero, and that indicates a fault condition. Why, why wouldn't it, I mean, milliamps, why don't we use a much higher current? Um, it would be less susceptible to noise, less sensitive to noise. And the answer lies in what we call the combustion triangle. If we look at this, what do we require to create an explosion? Well, we need uh, three things. We need um, air, but actually we need oxygen, but we, we talk about air, we need air, we need a source of fuel, we need sufficient vapor, and we need a source of ignition. Let's have a look at probably the most sensitive um, fuel, and if I get those in combination, I'm going to get a bang, an explosion. This shows the concentration levels for hydrogen. This is an ignition curve for hydrogen air. And as I vary the concentration, if there is too little, that's my uh, lower flammable level, if there's too little hydrogen, um, I can't ignite it. And Similarly, if there is too much hydrogen, not enough oxygen, it won't ignite. But within that curve level, it will, it's ignitable. What I want you to really look at here is how much energy. Now, uh, the energy required to ignite the hydrogen 
um, from a spark, for example, is 0 0.02 millijoules. That's 20 microjoules. And then you ask, well, what is a joule? A joule is a source of energy. And just to give you an example, um, if I had an apple and I lift the apple by um, one meter, or let's call it one yard, I lift it up um, in the air by one yard, I'm using one joule of energy. In this case, I only require to ignite this hydrogen 20 microjoules, which is an incredibly small amount. So I've got to be very careful of the amount of energy that I put into my system. And fortunately, I've got curve. Now let's have a look at this. This is the energy requirements in terms of um, uh, the power. Bear in mind, a joule is a watt second. So um, at, for example, 28 volts, I need to ensure that the current into my system never exceeds 93, because if it ex exceeds 93 milliamps, or this exceeds 28 volts, that combination, I'm going to get an explosion. Um, we look at this a little further. We have a system uh, where we have a safe area. Uh, here's my hazardous area. This is where I would have, for example, um, in the case I'm talking about, hydrogen present. I have a control system. I've got a, um, a field device. I want to ensure that under no circumstances am I ever going to get sufficient energy put into this system under open circuit, short circuit conditions that would trigger an explosion. And we use a safety barrier. And a safety barrier uh, comprises, um, uh, uh, in its simplest system like this, it's got a fuse. Um, so if, the, if there's a short circuit here, the fuse will blow. But I'm also going to limit it. I've got current limiting resistors. I've got Zener diodes that limit the voltage that that can actually rise to maximum. Um, and I'm making use of an, what's called an IS ground. So the whole point of this safety barrier is to make sure that I never get large voltage or large currents, that's the most important, um, and developed into my field device. So that is why I'm really limited to quite low uh, currents, which is, as I mentioned, the 4 to 20 milliamp. The other advantage of using a offset, this 4 to 20 milliamp, is that um, generally a transmitter was usually powered externally from it needs power. I've got, a, I've got an amplifier. It needs to be powered. I need a, a supply voltage, a supply current. Um, and typically that was a 10 to 30 volt DC um, supply. Um, well, as the power requirements uh, with modern um, large scale integration, and particularly with the advent of what they call CMOS, um, CMOS complementary metal oxide silicon, which uses um, to power it only requires micro uh, watts or milliwatts. So it means that the we could reach a point where the device could be powered by less than four milliamp um, requirement. This meant that I could dispense with that. I've now got because this current will never be less than 4 milliamps. If it is, it's got a line break. I've got a fault anyway. But under normal circumstances, the least this can uh, uh, go down to is 4 milliamps. That means I've always got 4 milliamps flowing through this, and I can now have what is called a loop-powered transmitter. So there are five major advantages of the 4 to 20 milliamp loop. Um, we have um, firstly, I've got long distance transmission without signal loss. I've got allows detection of offline sensors, broken transmission lines, and um, other failures. It uses a fairly inexpensive two wire instrumentation cable. Um, used proper shielded twisted pair. Um, I've got very low sensitivity to um, uh, uh, electrostatic, electromagnetic interference, and it caters for loop powering. Let's have a look a little bit uh, closer. So shielded cable, 
um, uh, used to guard the low-level signals against outside interference. Uh, the shields, this is rather important. Shields of each cable are grounded at one end only. Um, this is a, 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 a common fault in installations that inadvertently, sometimes the shield gets grounded at two points. Um, and if that happens, you've lost your shielding capability. Um, ungrounded edge should be insulated to prevent accidental grounds or grounding or shorting. Okay, how do we calibrate? Well, actually, we make use of a calibrator. And a calibrator would be connected so that I'm going to simulate from the calibrator, I can simulate a zero to 10 millivolts. And I can at the same time measure the four to 20 milliamps. So um, we'll start off by just two adjustments. I produce zero to 10 millivolts, simulate a, a, a zero to 10 millivolts. Uh, and I'm going to simulate uh, a zero, zero in, and I will adjust the zero to, to ensure that I'm getting four milliamps out. All that's necessary then is to adjust the span. In other words, set that up to 10 millivolts and then adjust the span to give me 20 milliamps output. But this is all very well, but can we actually call it a temperature transmitter? And the answer is no, we can't. Uh, why? Because it's actually a millivolt transmitter. All it's doing is taking the zero to 10 millivolts and it's amplifying it and producing a four to 20 milliamp output, which I'm transmitting to the, um, the, the control room. It's not actually measuring, it's not taking into account the uh, linearization, it's not taking into account the scaling, it's not taking into account um, the, the fact that the, the thermocouples themselves are nonlinear and they're going to vary. So um, what would I need? Well, uh, in order to make it a temperature transmitter, I would need some form of linearization. I would need some form of input scaling. And I would need input device selection. Um, I don't want a separate transmitter for a T-type transmitter or a K-type transmitter. I want one transmitter where I can set the whole thing up. That means I would need to have some form of lookup table for a type T, uh, for a type J, that when I've got uh, 10 millivolts in input, that corresponds for a type T, as we've already seen, to a certain um, a certain uh, a temperature. So linearization, input scaling, input device selection. And all this is accomplished through the use of a microprocessor. Now, the only problem is that a microprocessor is a digital-based system. I've got an analog input. I've therefore got to convert it from an analog to a digital signal. So I need an A to D converter, analog to digital converter. Hang on a moment, this is an analog output. So that means I would also require a digital to analog converter. I now transmit it using a 4 to 20 milliamp signal. Um, and at the far end, where does the signal go to? Well, guess what? It, usually it's going to go to a PLC or some other uh, uh, um, a microprocessor based system where the first thing I'm going to do is make use of an A to D converter. And then logic tells us, wouldn't it be sensible to keep it all digital? And indeed, that's where um, some systems such as Foundation Fuel Bus come in, uh, Profit Bus, uh, maybe even Heart, which is a hybrid system, but all that will is, is dealt with in um, later on in the course on um, IC3. For the moment, let's just stick to our board of 20 milliamps because it is still the most widely used uh, uh, system going. I could put multiple devices in series if each has got sufficient power, maximum loop current. The transmitter remains calibrated, um, bearing in mind that a 4 to 20 milliamp transmitter needs at least 10 to 12 volts at the maximum for loop current. 
Let's have a look at this. What do you think of that? Do you think that works? Um, usually I can have up to four devices connected. I can have, uh, typically the transmitter is going to be loop powered. So there's my power supply. Uh, I've got a loop powered readout here. But of course that's absolute nonsense. I cannot have two transmitters in the same system. I can't have a pressure transmitter and a temperature transmitter in the same system. You can only have one transmitter. So actually that's total nonsense. Let's have a look at a more practical system. Here I've got a pressure transmitter. Uh, that's possibly in a storage tank. I've got a field indicator, which is a loop powered um, indicator on the side of the tank. I've got an indicator in the main control room. I've maybe got a chart recorder, some form in the supervisor's office. And I've got the input is actually going to a PLC in the control cabinet that's going to be con used for control purposes. Um, and we can certainly see here that I can supply 4 to 20 milliamp signals to multiple devices. The question is, what's the limitation? How many of these devices can I actually uh, have in my loop? Let's just have a look at a typical example. I've got a, an example of a power source, 24 volts. There's my power source, 24 volts. I've got a pressure transmitter. Um, and I've got each input is 250 ohms. So each input, 250 inputs, and that's going to provide a 1 to 5 volt input to each. That's my DCS, that's my PLC, and that's a chart recorder. My first question is, what is the total load resistance? Well, that's easy. The total load resistance in this case is 250, 250, 750 ohms. Next question is, is the pressure transmitter, this particular pressure transmitter, is it suitable? And the answer lies with um, um, this type of load limitation. Every transmitter data sheet will actually show what is called a load line. And uh, these will vary from different transmitters. This happens to be um, from um, uh, an Emerson 3511, I think it is. Um, and in this example, what is the maximum load for a 24 volt operating voltage? Well, we can see there's 25. As I move up there, it's going to be around about 630, 630 ohms. So is this suitable? The system's not going to work. I've got a load of 750 ohms, and this will only tolerate a total load of at 24 volts of about 630 ohms. So what can we do? Um, well, there's several things. Incidentally, how much of the voltage is dropped in the transmitter, and that would be Remember I said earlier that each transmitter requires a voltage somewhere between 10 and 12 volt. Well, in this particular case, it requires 10.8 volts. So that's a limiting factor. I can't put too much load into the system. What could I do about this? Well, one, I maybe, what about if I increase the supply voltage? If I increase the supply voltage, say to 28 volts, guess what? I've got 800 ohms. 800 ohms is above, means I could have a total um, load resistance of 750 ohms. Increasing the load or the voltage, supply voltage is usually impractical. So um, normally we can't do that. So we'll have a look at a, a, a solution. Um, let's just go back to this. Because this is looking at the solution, it's also looking at a slight problem. Because I've got all these devices all in series, and if I got a cable break, the whole lot would go out. So it can drive multiple devices, but a broken wire anywhere along the loop will cause a loss of signal to all devices. Not good. The solution lies with what we call a splitter repeater. Um, and basically, the splitter repeater. Um, means that obviously if I get a break here, yes, I'm going to get a failure. But a break here, if I disconnect that, does it matter? No. If I disconnect that, does it matter? No. 
also overcomes the problem of excessive loading. So if I have a load uh, um, that exceeds the power, uh, the load limitations of your transmitter, by using a splitter repeater, I can overcome the problem. Um, benefits of a load splitter allows the total reduction when the loop power is not sufficient. It splits one uh, 4 to 20 milliamp input loop into multiple independently scalable 4 to 20 milliamp outlook. Um, if I remove a device, it won't affect the other loops, and it powers two wire transmitters at 24 volts. Wonderful. And that's a typical uh, um, DIN rail uh, mount um, uh, loop splitter. I just want to deal with one very last thing, and that is um, I mentioned right at the beginning, we were going to look at the possibility of my 4 to 20 milliamps being able to do a little bit more. Well, let's have a look at it. It's based on the, uh, what's called the Namur Emblem, uh, or the NE43 standard, it's a German standard, but it's found um, it's gaining quite wide acceptance in the oil and gas industry. Generally, my 4 to 20 milliamp normal operating range. We also like to have a certain amount of normal under range. Take me down to about 3.8 milliamps. Um, a, a, a normal over range take me up to 20.5 milliamps. So I have the capabilities of having a, um, an over range and an under range. Um, anything less than 3.6 milliamps um, or usually 20 two milliamps is regarded as a failure. So I could have a failure when the, I get a line break or if, for example, the, uh, the voltage uh, suddenly went up for whatever reason. Um, but I've got a little gap here in the middle and that little gap um, is um, typically going to be between 3.6 to 3.8. And I could use that value of 3.6 7 milliamps as a transmitter failure detection. In other words, we have built-in diagnostics. How do I indicate that the, the transmitter has failed? I, all I need to do is say, well, the transmitter itself has gone kaput. It is no longer working, and it would immediately set the milliamp range down to 3.7. Um, alternatively, there are some companies that actually rather than go down to that level, we'll go to a level of typically 21.5 uh, milliamps. That's, uh, that actually is not part of the um, NE43 standard, but it is used by several companies. So there we are. We have um, a, this um, fairly simple system, 4 to 20 milliamp, has um, really uh, got quite a lot going for it. So, at the end of this module, you'll have learned how to explain the working principle of a thermocouple. Uh, we've uh, looked at the problems associated with amplifying a small voltage for transmission over a long distance. We've described the basic principles underlying the, the 4 to 20 milliamp uh, loop. Um, we've had a look at some of the bases of intrinsic safety to show why we use such a low current. Um, we've also been able to select a transmitter based on load limitations, and we've identified why we need to look at a loop splitter repeater. And finally, we can show, we've shown how we can provide a diagnostics fault output. Well, there you are, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, if there are any questions, uh, you can get in contact me with uh, questions. So. All right, thank you, Mick, so much for such a wonderful presentation. Um, as Mick discussed during the presentation, all topics that were covered today are also discussed in further detail in our Instrumentation Controls Fundamentals for Facilities Engineers course. Other courses covering topics in instrumentation and controls um, can be seen on the screen. Find your next course at petroskills.com. And once again, thank you, Mick, for um, presenting for us today. And we look forward to seeing you all in an upcoming PetraSkills John M. Campbell course. Thank you.